Muy buenas tardes, soy Evaristo Aguilar y quiero darles la bienvenida al segundo encuentro internacional de la Red de Ecología Acústica de México. El sonido y el arte en los proyectos interdisciplinarios es una de las líneas de investigación de la REA MX y a continuación tendremos la participación de Vanessa Tomlinson y Jocelyn Wolf, quienes nos acompañan en esta tarde desde Australia. La doctora Vanessa Tomlinson es percusionista con formación en Australia, Alemania y los Estados Unidos y posee una larga trayectoria en la música experimental, explorando siempre nuevas ideas sonoras colaborativas a través de diferentes disciplinas artísticas. Ha presentado su obra por el mundo en los principales festivales internacionales de música de vanguardia. Como subdirectora del Queensland Conservatorium Research Center, y presidenta de Música y Creatividad en la Griffith University en Australia. Dirige proyectos de investigación artística internacionales y ayuda a definir la agenda de los artistas escénicos en la academia. La doctora Jocelyn Wolf es investigadora adjunta del Queensland Conservatorium Research Center de la Griffith University en Australia. Es cofundadora de Piano Mill y codirectora del Harrigan's Lane Collective. Su investigación explora la cultura del sonido, las dimensiones metafóricas del sonido musical y las intersecciones creativas de la música y la arquitectura. Le recuerdo eh, que pueden realizar sus preguntas a través de la sección de comentarios en nuestro canal de YouTube y al final tendremos un espacio para responderlas. Es un gusto recibir a Vanessa y a Jocelyn, quienes presentarán la conferencia especializada Shaping Space in Sound. Esta conferencia eh, va a estar en idioma inglés, va a ser la presentación en idioma inglés y estamos listos para comenzar. Please, Jocelyn, thank you. Welcome. I'm Vanessa. Hello everyone, I'm Jocelyn and I'll be presenting first in this presentation today. Um, and I do hope that we are joined by Vanessa Tomlinson. She is currently in a, a weather situation which is preventing her access to internet, but um, she's going to be trying to join um, in about 15 minutes time. So let's I'm here, Jocelyn. That... I'm here. She's here. I made it. I know. Yes, you made it, <laughs> Vanessa. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. So we'll switch PowerPoints halfway through. Okay, all right, so in our presentation, we think through sound and space from the perspectives of architecture, the built environment, music and listening. Keeping listening as the central concern, we look at a project um, that we did together called Out of the Auditory, and we go through the relationship historically and the current trends, the relationship of music and architecture, And we go through different modes of listening and ways of interacting with spaces in which we gather to share musical ideas. We'll conclude with sharing our latest research project. We'll, um, it's called the Immersive Guitar, and it's a, an oversized acoustic guitar which operates as an instrument, installation and potential performance space. So this is what you can expect in our talk. Most of us gathered here for this conference spend most of our lives surrounded by architecture, by structures designed for working and living in. But it may come as a surprise that one of the less common applications of listening is in architectural design. Now, I'm a musicologist, and I found this out when I asked a question to a seminar of architects. I asked, what are important aspects of good architectural design. No one mentioned sound. The fact is thinking about sound in the built environment seems to be mainly the concern of acousticians, acoustic ecologists and soundscape artists. My question to the architects and some further reading prompted a project at Griffith University in Brisbane, Australia. This was back in 2014.
It involved two years of an embedded course for third year architecture students working with, with music students to design a temporary installation to the entry of Queensland Conservatorium. So this is the site. Now look at these bare bricks and surfaces. Do they engage you sonically? The point of our project was to get the students to think about the purpose of an entry to a building designed for music making and to imagine sonic interventions in the space that might bring focus to the act of listening. We wanted the architecture students to think about sound as part of their design process, to think creatively about the sonic properties of materials and structures and to imagine how sonic interventions can improve our sensory experience of built environments. The students responded really well with materials and structures that did invite listening, as you see here. In this way, our project was inspired by the notion of oral architecture. Oral architecture, in case you aren't familiar with it, is a relatively new discipline. It makes, potential, makes the potential of sound more explicit in design. How spaces can be experienced by proactive or attentive listening in contrast to passive hearing. The practice takes into account meaning, emotion and symbolism contained in sounds as defined by our cultural frameworks. Oral architecture makes a compelling strategy for promoting change in the architectural design of spaces we live and work in. The need for change arises out of a perceived shortfall in architectural thinking about sound as one of the senses that fundamentally engage us with place. Architects visualize spaces and draw them. As a result, oral effects, the oral architecture of a space is too often an incidental or even an accidental consequence of design. It's also been noted that there's too much focus on controlling noise to consider more creative and aesthetic uses of sound. As a benchmark study in this area, Paul Raff Studio has been developing a means of representing sound in the refurbishment of the Canadian Music Centre in Toronto. The entrance is described as an ear cleaning space, taking people from the noise of a busy Toronto street into an expressly different oral experience inside. Then the public floor in the foyer, by means of using different surfaces to walk on and resonate, tunes people into the role of listener. Further into the building is a performance space, as you see here, with an installation of timber petals. They present challenges, intentional challenges for a performer to work with. But the shortfall in thinking about sound in architectural design has not always been so. From prehistory to the modern day, we can observe how architectural design, architectural traditions and the acoustic characteristics of buildings have had a fundamental influence on musical identity across most societies in the world. Ultimately, while architecture and music differ in materiality, they both define a type of space and are organized and structured that way. It's been argued that architectural traditions of different cultures even fundamentally influenced whether the music developed as predominantly melodic or rhythmic. This is then related visually through what we see. So for example, this Neolithic subterranean structure in Malta has a resonant niche cut into the middle chamber designed to project specifically chanting or drumming through the rest of the space. But it was from around the sixth century BC that music and architecture became intimately joined in the Western world through the idea that they both define a kind of order revealed by mathematics and geometry. Conceived by Pythagoras, this was the theory of harmonic ratios that would be embedded in the formation process, processes in music and architecture over many centuries. The 19th century notion that architecture is frozen music was born out of the writings 
of Roman imperial architect Vitruvius, who was profoundly influenced by Pythagoras. Vitruvius explored how columns, such as you see here, should be designed by analogy with various musical modes and how stone theatres could be made to resonate like musical instruments. Even in the Middle Ages, Pythagoras's harmonic ratios were still being used to give the performance of music particular significance in the church. Architecture, the mirror of eternal harmony, music, its echo. In the Lutheran church after the Reformation, the insertion of galleries allowed more, more room for congregation. Despite the tall ceilings and resonant space, the fact that these galleries were filled with people wearing layers of clothes and heavy cloaks as they did in those days, made the acoustic drier. So it was possible for Bach, for example, to compose with more notes and harmonic layers than was previously attainable. Westminster Abbey and the smaller Chapel Royal in England. These two buildings inspired very different music from one composer, Purcell. The Gothic arches and columns of the Abbey were perfect vehicles for the ceremonial music that became a signature of the uniquely English Baroque style that Purcell developed. His organ and choral music for the smaller chapel led to a characteristic style of church music that was copied throughout the country. Now, St. Mark's in Venice. Imagine the music of Monteverdi and Gabrielli, the madrigals and masses filling this space with a forest of voices, and so on. All of these composers' works are now heard across the world in completely different spaces, yet their, com their composition ultimately defines them as originally belonging to an interconnected architectural and musical history, the result of the buildings they were composed for, and of course, the politics of the time. We can think of this as architecture really making the sound, a visual record of sonic musical histories. During the 18th century, secular music prospered. Amongst the elite, dedicated music rooms became popular with attention given to their acoustic characteristics expressed in the architecture, as well as what, in what was heard. Mirrored walls for the reflection of sound, as you see here, where you might imagine the string quartets of Haydn. By the 19th century, the rise of the middle class, along with rapid industrial and urban growth, demanded larger concert halls. Liberated from the church and private patronage, composers were, in a sense, also liberated from prescribed architectural settings. From monumental concert halls like this to flexible multimedia studios, we witness how the democratization of concert going places different demands on composers. Now, generations of acoustic and audio specialists have created multi-use auditoria like this with audio visual technologies. And in so doing, have changed how what we hear connects with what we see and therefore experience. Where composers once responded to architecture with innovations in musical styles and instrumentations, their works have become part of an expanding repertoire that might be performed anywhere. At this point, music is no longer understood through the architecture. On the other hand, some concert halls have become refined spaces for listening, like Frank Gehry's Disney Hall, described as a precisely tuned instrument for listening. Now, the 20th century also saw a very boutique revitalization and evolution of those old relations. Notably, this began with architect Le Cabousier, who inspired compo composer Xenarchus to integrate specific musical principles into architectural forms, like this so-called flying glissando in the Phillips Pavilion. But these generally make allusion to sound rather than drawing attention to sound through the materials of design and experience of the space. Some architectural creations go so far as to reference instrument design, but they don't always take the analogy to an operational level. 
But one good example is this house by an architect in collaboration with a sonic installation artist. Yes, it's a house. It's an instrument and a performance space in one. The architecture of the house is the structure, bridge and resonator for a series of giant string instruments. The strings are made of specially developed brass and wire. The patterns of the strings are extensions of the architectural lines of the house, but they can also be sounded. Now this ancient kinship, this, this um, connective tissue of sound and architecture informs at least one aspect of Vanessa Tomlinson's thinking about the act of listening. And now I think Vanessa can actually join us. Hi Is that everyone. right, Vanessa? Hi everyone, lovely to be here. I'm just gonna share my screen. And join in. Um, thank you, I'm coming to you from the south of Australia. Um, it's a very windy day and I apologize, there's been a lot of internet issues here. Um, yes, I hope that in every one of those photographs of buildings, you imagined the sound of that building, whether it's an oboe or a koto, it conjured up some idea of the resonance, of the volume, of the height, of the dryness or whatever of each of those spaces. And this is what I'm particularly interested in, but taking away the building and going outside into the environment. I've been doing a project called Soundings for a very long time, which is activating spaces or places by a musician where we are investigating or information seeking and performing. So it's through the doing that we find out about the space. And I'm trying to say, how can site-specific performance lead to new knowledge and relationships? How can site-specific performance help to activate listening and therefore understanding of place and who and what is listening and who and what is playing? Lastly, can artistic work affect change in a site leaving memories, transformations and fragments. And this is probably the thing that I'm most interested in, the idea that we have these memories that are deeply embedded in place and relational um, things with sound. So this started back in 2009 with a project called Sounding Wyvernhoe. And what you see here is a depleted water source for the city of Brisbane. This is my city, this is where we get the water and this was in drought. I could not understand drought. The way I learned to understand it was to take musicians to the site, get them to play on site and get us to stand on land that should have been underwater. So the sound helped me, but also the gathering of people in place helped me understand. I wanna just play you a little excerpt of a more recent sounding. Uh, which is much closer to um, well, this time. It's about five hours west of Brisbane on Gungaree country. And this is just a little bit about my process of understanding place. We don't have those beautiful columns, but we have magnificent trees. We have a nice water source here. We have a creek bed and we can still hear sound operating in place. Take a listen. In every note we are playing there, I am fact finding. I'm sending notes out. I'm seeing what species respond. I am listening to how my sound resonates and I'm making determinations about how to balance and play just like the water is making determinations about how to flow. 
Another site where I've done a lot of investigations in sound is up here at the property of Jocelyn Wolf um, called Harrigan's Lane. And in this place, there's a lot of granite, there are huge valleys, there are dense forests, and each project that happens here investigates how sound functions in these particular areas. You can see a little bit of the deep valley coming out here. And I want to play you a small excerpt from a composition which is on the top of the hill, looking down over the valley, and just listen to the resonance of different instruments and try and imagine the topography and the geography of place. That composition goes for about an hour, so I won't be playing that all for you today, but if you'd like to get any of the links to these compositions, I'm happy to share them with you later. Now, on the same site is this building here, which is called the Piano Mill. It was designed by architect Bruce Wolfe um, with music by Eric Griswold. I took on the role as our musical director and Jocelyn is the researcher involved in this project. It houses 16 pre-loved pianos inside the building two against each section of the wall, four on each wall. And it's listened to from the outside. It's an instrument, essentially. It's a piano mill, it generates piano sound, but it's also a house for these 16 um, pianos that are slowly detuning and devolving over the years. It's also a playground. Um, about uh, seven composers have written compositions for this. Four albums have been released of compositions. And let me play you its theme song so you can start to hear a bit of the sound of this instrument come architecture in environment. Again, that's an hour long piece, so please check it out if you're interested. Recently, I was asked to do a performance in a public space in COVID. Due to restrictions and changes, we needed to gather outdoors. I was playing a solo Tam Tam composition in my city of Brisbane. And what became really interesting in this gathering was that I was making my own architecture. I was making my own sonic bubble, which was the space in which you could hear the Tam Tam. So when you were inside my sonic bubble, you were in the performance. And when you were outside of it, you were just riding your bike, you were just hanging out, walking, doing whatever. And I realized that we don't actually have to have architecture to define sonic spaces. And this started me on thinking about new rituals of listening, how we can define what a listening space could be. It's extended further with the project Jocelyn mentioned at the beginning the last thing I'll talk about, which is the immersive guitar. The brainchild of guitarist, um, Karen Sharp, uh, she had always enjoyed the feeling of a guitar against her belly when she played, the resonance. And she'd always wanted to go inside the guitar to listen. 
to become very small, to crawl inside her guitar and imagine the sound from that perspective. So what we are doing together with this research team is building a guitar that's 11 and a half times the size of a normal guitar. So we can now, as you can see on the right there, we can walk into the guitar, look up and be inside the body of a guitar. It's like being in a womb. It's like being surrounded and ensconced in sound. The sound boxes are like resonant cajons. The strings still operate like strings, but you're playing them over your head. And the idea is that this is a performance space. So it's like a little mini concert hall, an installation, and also an instrument. Trying to re-inspire this idea of architecture, space, environment, and ideas about listening. Now, when I listen, these are some of the words that I think about. And I imagine architects think about some of these words as well. They're words that inspire shape, they inspire the journey of sound, and they make us really think about materiality and our environment. That's where I'd like to leave it today. I'd like to say a huge thank you to Evaristo for inviting us to be part of this incredible conference. Um, I feel a long way away in Australia from you in Mexico, but at the same time, I feel very close to all of you because I know we share many things in common. On behalf of Jocelyn and I, thank you very much for letting us present. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa and Jocelyn, for this wonderful uh, presentation. We are glad uh, you made it on uh, Vanessa because we know about the inconvenience for, for the connection to the internet. And uh, I'll just uh, take a, a look on the, if there is any question on the live, uh, YouTube live. And if there is any question, I will just, um, yeah, read it to you. Um, so, eh, ¿hay alguna pregunta de alguno de los eh, personas que nos están acompañando ahora por el, por el YouTube, por el canal de YouTube? Eh, ellas están dispuestas para contestar ahora mismo en, en tiempo real si alguien tuviera alguna pregunta o algún comentario. Damos un, un momento para ello. Y mientras tanto, eh, esta presentación, esta conferencia tuvimos oportunidad de, eh, de observarla, de presenciarla en, eh, en la Universidad de Hull, en Inglaterra, hace algunos años en una eh, conferencia también de, de sonido y ambiente. Eh, al parecer no tenemos eh, alguna pregunta ahora mismo, pero obviamente ellas estarán al pendiente. Eh, por si surge alguna, alguna pregunta, podrán eh, contestarla de manera posterior. Y de esta, de esta manera vamos a, a concluir esta, esta sesión y agradeciendo a nuestras invitadas. I think we are uh, closing the session now and uh, we'll leave it the, the questions and uh, you can, uh, uh, after you can maybe take a look and, uh, and, uh, and answer these questions. But uh, right now we are just want to say thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks everyone for having you. us. Have a it's great day. It's lovely to have you in, in Mexico. Thank you. <laughs>